It's sharing. Now? Yeah, it's sharing. It says it started screen sharing. Now we can see. Go for it. I can't hear your sound though. Okay. Now, but now? Perfect. Everything is. So, what we're going to be discussing here is a number of new developments that took place. And what I want to do is I want to start by giving you a, a quick summary of what those are without explaining them in any way other than a sentence. Then I'm going to go into a discussion of why the scrolls are important in general, what they are in general. Then we're going to circle back, say, in about 40 minutes to what are those uh, really in, uh, new things that have happened and why are they therefore significant. So to give us a sense now just quickly of what we're talking about, what some of the news that things that have been going on, one thing which isn't really new, so to speak, uh, literally this, uh, you know, this last couple of months, but it's very important, is the Leon Levy Dead Sea Scrolls, a digital library of the Israel Antiquities Authority, which is giving us absolutely phenomenal access now to the scrolls. And then we have the question of the post-2002 forge fragments, which have hit the news in a big way. Then we have the issue of DNA testing. And on DNA testing, uh, we've had some recent news. I'm going to be telling you that it may not be as important as it sounds. Then we have the Manchester. This is the uh, UK aspect of the whole story. The, the Manchester story, which is that there were some fragments brought to Manchester in the 50s in order to be able to test out the uh, question of the nature of the writing material. They sat with, the, they were sent by in those days, uh, you know, Jerusalem was such that the scrolls were primarily in East Jerusalem, sent by the Jordanians, and they've recently been turned out that they have writing on them. No one knew that before. They thought they were sending blank stuff so they could investigate blank, uh, blank uh, fragments. Anyhow, and then we have the uh, new efforts going into digital paleography, evaluation of the scrolls, actual script, and the hope that that can help for dating. And then we had this recent conference at NYU, which was on the subject of Dead Sea Scrolls and recent scholarship. And I want to summarize for you some of the new developments that were being discussed there. And then, right, this is just a copy of the announcement of that program. You could have had four days of Dead Sea Scrolls. You could have been on every single day we had. By the way, I have to tell you, this is amazing. The, uh, there were 850 people there at any time, at least on the first day, which is a Sunday, rest of the time at least 650. And the actual totals of people who participated were even larger than that, showing that the scrolls are certainly very popular. Now, to start out, we have to understand that the uh, scrolls originate in uh, a, an area where we now know there was what we call the Qumran settlement. Now, this is a place that was occupied from about 100, and, 100 BCE on through the destruction of the site in about 68 CE, which of course is right before the destruction of the temple in 70, and the destruction of Masada, which is to the south of Qumran at, uh, at in, in 73. And Qumran is on the shore of the Dead Sea, and this, of course, is the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Now, you have to understand that the simplistic story about the Bedouin boy is not really the key to understanding this, because what happened was there was a series of, uh, of explorations after the initial 1947 founding, finding of uh, seven scrolls that are the main complete ones that you see in the Shrine of the Book in Israel, you have to understand that the rest of the material was found after the 48 war in Jordan, and that material ended up in the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem. And, and the buildings that were there were those you're looking here south at the site. You, these buildings were used by the sectarian group, which scholars have argued about who they are. The mainstream view, even though I've raised some questions about this, is that they are the Essenes a sect mentioned by Josephus as one of the three major sects of Jews in the Second Temple period in the second century, first century BCE, running in through the first century now of our era. The only problem, of course, is we don't know what the word Essene means, and it doesn't occur in the scrolls, but there are a lot of parallels between this group and the group Josephus refers to. 
Now, the group that we are talking about emphasized tremendously issues pertaining to ritual purity. And here you see one of the earliest mikvahs <coughs> that existed. <coughs> and we can go further to see here uh, an example of a cistern. Of course, it was very difficult. Some people think these are all mikvahs. The problem with that theory is then there'd be no water source. So anyhow, the site was occupied by probably something like 400 people. And the group probably had members throughout the country who lived at other sites. Now, I wanted to show you a few things to understand the level of the Judaism of these people. Here, I don't know I, if we were in a regular public lecture, I'd say, can anyone guess this is what this is? But this is a tefillin shel rosh, a head tefillin. And these tefillin are very small. They're about three-eighths of an inch by three-eighths of an inch. And here you can see it's divided into four sections the same way as any tefillin would be divided. And then you see the inside passages. Now, the inside passages here, uh, which uh, look uh, quite small, these three-eighths inch, some of you may have seen German tefillin. The old German tefillin were very small like that. German Jews wore such tefillin. But anyhow, what I wanted to explain is that we find at the site, when the tefillin are opened up, and by the way, talking about new developments, there will soon, I hope, I don't know when, be a development when they figure out through all kinds of x-ray techniques, how to read a closed, two, three closed fill and they haven't been able to open because they don't want to destroy them. But at any rate, you have here two types of fill in one that has exactly the same portions that the rabbis command us to have that in our modern fill in and one that actually have a, uh, a number of not additional passages, but the passage above and below ours because they either started early or went down Below. Now, I won't ask if anyone knows what the passage is right before Shema Yisrael, but I'll tell you it's the Ten Commandments. And so, therefore, some children at Qumran have the Ten Commandments in them. At any rate, we have about 20 uh, something, 25 of these children. We have children from later on from the Bar Kokhba documents. This and the mikvahs, I think I'm showing you quickly to give you a sense of the continuity also of Judaism. It's kind of an amazing thing. We go back, you know, 2,200 years and Jews are doing a lot of the things that they're still doing today. Now, when we get to the scrolls themselves, so now most of the scrolls are not really scrolls. Most are fragments, but I'm going to show you a few scrolls. So this is the great Isaiah scroll. Now, this already demonstrates, on the one hand, commonalities, but non-commonalities. Let me explain why. First of all, this is a scroll of the entire book of Isaiah, from the very beginning to the end. Now, this particular text, you can see when you look at it, it looks almost like a Torah scroll. If I hadn't photographed it badly, you'd be able to see that the margin on the bottom has to be bigger than the margin on the top. And that is the way it is in the Torah. You have ruling lines between the columns, and you have ruling lines that the letters hang from. And you have the sewing, which doesn't look far off from what we are actually used to. Now, I'll point out, by the way, that uh, you may notice that the left margins aren't even. The left margins are not even until the aesthetics of printing. Once the aesthetics of printing come, then the scribes start to make those long letters like the Hayes and Dalids that are in the older Torah scrolls to make sure that the left margins are even. But I tell you this for a funny reason. About every, I don't know, six, eight months, somebody writes me an email. I got one about uh, two, three weeks ago. I have a Dead Sea scroll, and I think you might be interested in it. And of course, it's just an old Torah scroll. And the minute you look at it, if the left margin is even, it's after the development of printing. So this is not this stuff is not old at all. But at any rate, this is a kind of a common problem when it comes to uh, people trying to sell what they claim are Dead Sea Scrolls. But now, what's interesting about this Isaiah scroll is it's not exactly the same as our Yeshayahu, which is what you have in another manuscript. Because what happened here is someone copied the entire text into a different Hebrew dialect. Now you say, what are you talking about? Well, these sectarians had a Hebrew dialect, and their dialect has some funny words. For example, the Hebrew word key is spelled an aleph at the end. The Hebrew word lo, no, is always spelled with an extra, an extra vav in the middle. But they spell who with a hey at the end, like it sounds like you'd say hua for he, that is to say the, the you know, he is going, hua, hua holech, you say, right? 
And for the uh, feminine, it looks like Hia. It's a kind of a funny type of, 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 of thing. So one of the things you have to understand, because this you'll, need, you'll hear about in a few minutes when we get to the question of the, the recent DNA test, is that besides having biblical texts that are more or less like ours, they have some texts that represent either interpretations sometimes woven into the text, the text adapted, or the text written into another Hebrew dialect. And that's what you're seeing right here. Now, an example of this phenomenon is a uh, Tehillim scroll, a Psalm scroll. This is an amazing text. They have in it a whole lot of texts from Tehillim, but they also have texts that are not from Tehillim. It's really a prayer scroll, not a Tehillim scroll. And it shows a very important difference between these sectarians and our view, the view of the Talmud, because they had an idea that interpretation and text can sometimes mix, something which the rabbis did not approve of at all, and which you won't see. We have careful to even use a different script in order to make sure that we wouldn't uh, mix interpretation. That's the origin of so-called Rashi script. Rashi didn't write in that script. It was a script that was used by the printers when they printed Rashi, but they printed the first Rashi that way, so you know it's a commentary. And once that got started, the tradition continued. Well, these people didn't have that idea of keeping them separate. They didn't mind if they were mixed in ways that we would not normally have been willing to, to uh, tolerate as in the regular Jewish, uh, Jewish method of dealing with these things. Now, this text over here, is a really interesting biblical text. It is a scroll of uh, Yeches, uh, oh, I'm sorry, of Ayikra, of the book of Leviticus. And this scroll is written in the old Hebrew script, the one again the rabbis told us not to use because that script was replaced by the one that we use in something like the fifth century BCE. But nonetheless, this script was being used by them. So you have to understand a little bit to them that they are in a, a, a different approach. This is a sectarian group. They have a little bit of a different approach in which there's a looseness about the way in which they hand down the Bible, which is not the same as the Talmudic rabbis that we're used to. And here's another example of the phenomenon. This is a text of Bamidbar in which interpretation is woven into the, uh, the text. Now, what I'm going to show you a really interesting thing, this is what's called the oldest Ten Commandments. But it's really not the Ten Commandments. It starts at the beginning, if you see my cursor, with the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy, the Varim, which uh, commands us, by the way, to say the grace after meals. And then it goes on and gives us an amazing Ten Commandments because it mixes the Ten Commandments of Devarim, De Deuteronomy, with that of Shvot Exodus. So clearly, this is not a biblical text. Now, what is it doing? It's giving us a very interesting message because when you mix the two Ten Commandments, you get two reasons for keeping Shabbat. You get the reason which says that we keep Shabbat because of the fact that we were taken out of Egypt. And you get the reason, that is to say we were slaves in Egypt and we have to give a day of rest and our animals and our servants and all that, and our family, everyone has to rest. And then we have the other reason that we're remembering the uh, fact that the world was created in seven days. And of course, this is what we do in the Kiddush, when if you look carefully this coming Friday night, you'll see that there are two sentences there at the end, right? You'll see that it says that it's a remembrance of creation and it's a remembrance of the uh, fact that uh, we had been slaves in Egypt and God took us out. Now also, we also say that in the Chadodi, when you say that the words Shamor and Zahor, right, were said by God simultaneously, that means that the two versions of the Ten Commandments, which are slightly different in Shvot and Devarim, are one. So here you see they are sharing a tradition that we have, and yet they're expressing it by rewriting a kind of Tanakh, which we wouldn't do. Another interesting thing here is that they had Aramaic translations of parts of the Bible. And here you see fragments of one from Eov. I want you to notice now that what you're seeing is fragments and not scrolls. And that's the whole story of the jigsaw puzzle that we're going to return to later when we speak about the, the, the recent developments that have been going on. Now here, there's another fact about these people, that they have various apocryphal books. Now, when we use the term in Dead Sea Scroll Scholarship, apocryphal, we're talking about one of three sections of text. 
basically the Dead Sea Scrolls as a collection. And you need to know there are about 900 manuscripts, which because of multiple copies of the same text, boil down to about 300 different texts. Now these are divided approximately close to equally between Bible, but of course in Bible you only have, you know, 24 texts, but that's beside the point. But the numbers of manuscripts are divided between Bible and what we call apocryphal, which means books like the Bible or about the Bible. And the third type is the literature of the sect. Now we're going to see that the sect in its literature has all kinds of negative views about other Jews. And this is because they disagree with all the other Jews. And because sometime after 152 BCE, when after the Maccabean revolt, Yonatan, Jonathan the Hasmonean, the Maccabean king, set up a essentially a dynasty in Yerushalayim. These people led by a group of Kohanim who apparently come originally from the sect of the Sadducees, they exited from the temple and from being Kohanim there, from being priests there and created a sect because they disagreed with the views that were becoming normal at that time, which were those of the Prushim, the Pharisees, who were the forerunners of the Talmudic rabbis. We're going to repeat that again because it's a complicated set of issues. But the point is that these sectarians held books of three types. They had first the books that represented our Tanakh, which is more or less that their Tanakh is our Tanakh. Then they have books which represent these apocrypha Bible-like books, books about the Bible, like the Bible, etc. And the third type of book they have is the sectarian material, which represents their animus against other Jews with whom they disagreed. Now, here you see also a very interesting text which shows they had texts interpreting the Tanakh. This is an interpretation of Sefer Breshit. Now we get to the material of their own sectarian group. So here we have to explain. These people had some views about some things theologically very different from what you are used to in Judaism and what is the normal Judaism, because they believed that the world is divided into people who are predestined to be good or evil. And when these predestined people who are predestined to be good or evil go through life, their ability to be different from what they're starting out is has been predestined by God. And therefore, some strange way, which I still can't figure out, they have this belief that you can be punished for transgressions that you were predestined to do. And this is something that I don't totally understand. But even though I don't totally understand it, we do know that that's their belief. And this document here is called the Rule of the Community. And it sets forth these beliefs. Then it sets forth how you get into the group through a complex initiation system which is similar to the one that Josephus discusses regarding the sect of the Essenes, and which is also, by the way, the Hebrew word Esim for Essenes just began in the 15th century. It's not an ancient word. And he sets that forth for the Essenes. And also, besides that, it's also similar to a group called the Haverim, who are mentioned, Haverim means literally friends, but here it means some kind of associates who observed very strictly the laws of Tuma and Tara, purity and impurity regarding food in the time of the Mishnah. And so this is quite, quite interesting. Now, I also want you to notice while you're looking at this, you can see here in various places, uh, corrections made in the text. And there are a variety of corrections in these texts which show over the years that they were used. But this is your third type of literature. Again, Bible first, second apocryphal type about the Bible, like the Bible, third type, the sectarian literature of the group. Now, this is an example of a sectarian commentary. I, I hope you'll notice, if you see, my cursor will find for you that the divine name is written here. You should be able to see the cursor, I hope. It's written here in the Old Hebrew script. And these are interpretations that understand, they're called in Hebrew, Pesher. They understand the Bible in light of the contemporary events. And they claim that various contemporary events are actually, uh, that are, have been foretold, are now coming about in their own time. And one has to be honest and say that this type of biblical interpretation does have things in common with the New Testament. 
we're going to see that there are certain things in the scrolls that legitimately, not like some of the crazy people say that they're some kind of proto-Christians, but legitimately show trends of thought that Judaism, as we know, it did not accept, but that did become normative in, uh, Christ in, in uh, Christianity. We'll see a few examples. This is an amazing thing, because just like to show you the condition of the way some of these scrolls were found. This is one of the original seven scrolls that was supposedly found in a jar, in one of those clay jars. Now, this is crumped up, crumpled up, like when you throw something in the garbage pail, and you crumple it up and throw it in the garbage pail, because like, you don't want to recycle it, as we would say today. And, and that's what you're seeing. But you know what this is? It's a type we call the Hodayot. And the Hodayot, it means the Thanksgiving song beautiful poems with all types of beautiful religious ideas. Some of them could be slipped into our moxer for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. You'd read them and you'd think it's the perfect prayer. You would never know that they didn't belong there. But on the other hand, the text has this idea of complete predestination and also some negative ideas about the physical part of our person. Let's put it that way. Because we have, of course, a body and a soul and it has some very negative aspects about the physical part of our life, which don't seem to be typical of uh, our rabbis and our trends, even though those trends do exist sometime in, in later Judaism, but not to the extent that you have here. Now, just to show you some other aspects of what's going on in these scrolls, so here you have a text which was found not only in Qumran, but also Masada. Here I have to tell you, a few of the Dead Sea Scrolls were also found at Masada, not the sectarian ones. Some scholars think that some people ran away from Qumran to Masada. Qumran was destroyed by the Romans in 68, Masada in 73. My own view is not that. I take the view that these are types of books that were common among Jews at that time and were being read by some Jews at Masada as they were being read by some Jews at Qumran. At any rate, this is a very interesting proto-mystical text. It points towards some of the ideas in the Kabbalah because this is a text that describes the heavenly praise of the angels praying to God. Now, you know that that's a very important theme, even in our Kedusha prayer, when we say that we are going to praise God in the manner in which the, the angels are praising God. But nonetheless, the, these, the poetry here, the description of the divine throne, the description of the angelic hosts, it's very much similar to what we have in uh, later Jewish mysticism, it seems to indicate that some of those ideas are already quite common in Second Temple times. Now, this is my favorite scroll. And let me tell you why that is, it's the Temple Scroll. So years ago, I published uh, a volume of studies on this scroll. And then I published a preliminary edition. And right now, literally a week ago, I and a colleague, Andrew Gross, who teaches at Catholic University, where, by the way, his picture is on his email, has him in his talus and fillin, so nobody should make any mistakes. Anyhow, the two of us have completed a new edition, commentary, translations, everything of this scroll, and we're just waiting for the publisher to give us a sample format and start working on the book. This is a scroll in which the sections of the Torah from Shemot all the way to the, uh, to the, the middle of Devarim, where all the laws are, it reorganizes and rewrites the laws of the Torah, but it does so giving the authors interpretations. Now, they're all in biblical Hebrew, so again, it violates that thing that our rabbis teach us to keep the Bible separate from our interpretations of the Bible, and yet they don't do that. And this thing looks like a Torah. Unfortunately, the top of it is completely destroyed. Can't do anything about it just because of the way it was stored. There's a great story about how this text was recovered during the 1967 war in Bethlehem by uh, Israeli intelligence officers because they had been trying to sell it for some time and apparently they were successful in recovering it at that time. But the point that I want to make, this is really a scroll. And uh, most of what was discovered after the initial discovery is as I showed you fragments. This is a very, very important text because the scroll I just showed you hints in many places towards rulings in Jewish law that look like those of the sect of the Sadducees. And this document here is called Mitzat Masea Torah, which is an abbreviation, it's called MMT. And in this MMT text, it basically gives us the reasons why the sectarians split off 
again, after the Maccabean revolt, when some of the Kohanim who believed in the halachic views of the Tzdukim, the Sadducees, thought that the things going on in the temple were wrong, they could no longer serve there, they separated from the temple and created a uh, basically a sectarian group, which is our group that eventually located at the site of Qumran that I showed you at the beginning, where they eventually developed into the sect as we know it, and that may be the sect of the Essenes, the majority of you, but if it is, they, they came from a breakaway from a group of Sadducees originally. Now then, right, this text has helped tremendously to understand many other halachic texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jewish law texts, where, because we now know that these texts are dealing with a position on Jewish law, which is the one of the Sadducees and not the one of the Pharisees, the Prussian, the forerunners of the Talmudic rabbis. This is a very well-known scroll, the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. It shows that there's going to be a great messianic war. In that messianic war, there is going to be uh, a, a battle between the sectarians and their followers, first against the other nations, and eventually also apparently against other Jews who don't agree with them, and they are come up and, and build the temple, and that actually is the subject of the temple scroll that I showed you before, because it tells you how the temple would be built and how it would operate. And here is a text, another text that I actually wrote a little book on. This is text, if you buy a Dead Sea Scrolls tie, which if you don't have one, you probably won't because the width of them is too wide for the current style because they were made years ago. But if you uh, owned one already, your Dead Sea Scrolls tie would have this text because it has no names of God in it. And the uh, religious Christian who made the Dead Sea Scrolls ties called me up. He said, please, I need your help because I know that it would be improper, be offensive for Jews to have divine names. We picked this text here. But this text is a wonderful text because it tells about the messianic banquet and the messianic assembly that are going to go on in the end of days after the battle in which the sectarians defeat their enemies and uh, redemption comes about. They definitely believed that redemption would require a great messianic war. They didn't believe in the idea of peaceful evolution, which I guess has become more and more normative over the ages. They thought there would be a great war. And this scroll describes the manner in which the messianic community would be conceived. Now I want to show you some things that were in the news years ago with great mistakes. In this case, this text was claimed to be the pierced Messiah text. People talked about how the whole story in the Dead Sea Scrolls about a pierced Messiah, but I can assure you there isn't, that the letters on the bottom are actually these two Lamids, the tops of the Lamids, and this word over here are telling us that it's a description of this very same battle I mentioned, and these words on the bottom that had to be restored are the corpses of the Romans. And it has nothing to do with the pierced Messiah, but up on the top of the text, it does talk about how a sectarian leader, the Nesih the prince of the community, will defeat the leader of the Romans, because they thought that when the Romans came to Eretz Israel in 63 BCE, this would lead to the Messianic War, and that Messianic War would lead for them to be victorious. This, of course, did not happen. Remember that the Romans came in 63 BCE. They ruled all the way through. In the middle, they had Herod as the king, and uh, that's the time when Herod rebuilt the Beit HaMikdash, the gigantic thing that we call the Harabai at the Temple Mount today. It's when Herod built the city of Caesarea that uh, probably you've all been to, and Herod also rebuilt, but effectively built, Masada as we know it. So you've seen a lot of his building projects if you've been to Israel, right? And then running all the way through, then the Romans continued to rule until they, uh, unfortunately, during the Great Revolt, destroyed the base of Mikdash, the temple. But at any rate, this is another example, two Orthodox rabbis that must have not listened at all in seventh or eighth grade or whatever, when they studied the book of Yehoshua, the book of Joshua, they saw over here the letters Yud, Shin, Vav, Ayin, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus. And so they were convinced that Jesus is mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that this is the biblical Joshua spelled without the Vav that you would expect to find there. This, by the way, this very aesthetic text is a list of passages which are uh, prophesying 
the coming of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, which was a very important thing for these sectarians. Now, here is a really interesting text that legitimately shows the extent to which Christianity comes out of varieties of Judaism that are not necessarily the main ones in Second Temple times, because over here in this text, you have mention of a son of God. And this son of God is probably a term for the Messiah, which of course we can all understand might have easily been the idea, expectation. This is an Aramaic text, probably dates to the third or early second century BCE. And these types of texts are very significant because the Aramaic materials go back to before the Dead Sea Scrolls sect was ever founded. And that's a very important principle, which is that the Dead Sea Scrolls allow us to understand certain things about the Judaism of the time, which in which there were various approaches. And the Prushim, which we read about when we study all those names in the first chapter of Pirkei Avot, of the Ethics of the Fathers, those people were indeed competing with other approaches that fell away with the destruction of the temple. And then, of course, the mainstream Judaism of the Mishnah and the Talmud becomes really, for all intents and purposes, without competition until actually in the sometime in the eighth century, they come up the Karaites, but then until you get to modern times, when Jews start to divide about how they want to observe Judaism. But uh, in ancient times, right, you see that some of these trends that existed in Second Temple Judaism affect Christianity. And we can find some, there are legitimate examples of this, as I mentioned. One curio I show you here is what we call the Copper Scroll. This is a list of buried treasures. It was embossed on copper, and it was found at Qumran, and it gives us all kinds of uh, interesting information about the development of Mishnaic Hebrew, because it's already transitional between Biblical and Mishnaic Hebrew, but no one has ever found the real treasures that it describes. By the way, there's a big debate whether really this is a real list. In other words, are these real treasures or imagined treasures? The people who think that this real treasures, they think that it's treasures that may have been hidden from the base of Mikdash so that they would not be uh, gotten by the Romans. And another view about it is that these uh, treasures never existed, that they're dreamt up. Actually, one of my grad students wrote a dissertation, which was published a 600 page book. And I think that uh, he since passed away, but, but he would have agreed that uh, the real treasure of the Copper Scroll is the treasure for understanding the history of the Hebrew language. And it's phenomenal for that. Now, we're now gonna return now to, in a certain sense, where we started. Okay, so now, what about the new developments? What's going on now that you have a sense of what the scrolls are? So it's very important to realize that the uh, study of the Dead Sea Scrolls has a whole history. I'm gonna give you in about five sentences this history. So it'll allow you to understand where we are now and what's going on now. First of all, you have to understand that Dead Sea Scrolls were not really discovered initially, believe it or not, in 1947. And that's because in 1911, a text was published in two medieval manuscripts, which turned out to be a Dead Sea Scroll. What do I mean it was a Dead Sea Scroll? It's medieval copies of texts that we didn't know before that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a kind of prehistory to Dead Sea Scrolls research. Now, the discussion of that particular text stopped because of World War II and the Holocaust. Then 47, the scrolls are discovered, and from about 47 to 67, you have the initial period. Remember that Israel recovered the seven full scrolls. All the fragments were found in Jordan when they excavated the caves or when the Bedouins stole those fragments from the caves in the period up to 67. Most of them were found in the 50s and there was a Christian group that was supposed to publish them in Jordan they published one quarter of them. And in 67, when Israel entered the old city, they recovered all of this in the Rockefeller Museum. Now this started a period from 67 to 1991 when the same Christian group was working and not publishing the scrolls. But on the other hand, there were a lot of Jewish scholars and younger scholars entering the field. But then what happened in 1991 
is that the monopoly of that group of scholars that was supposed to be publishing the scrolls and wasn't was broken down and the scrolls were released to the public and Israel took over the publication and organized a new publication team. That publication team led by Emmanuel Tov of the Hebrew University had about 60 people, Jews, Christians, anyone who could publish scrolls and knew how to do it. I was uh, honored to be a member of that team. Actually, most of us talk as if we're still operating. We're not operating anymore, but we are part of the team that published the scrolls. At any rate, and so starting officially in 2002, really in 2009, all of them were published. And that set off a whole bunch of developments of which we are going to talk about some of them. Not all of them, but only some of them now. Now, we're going to start with the recent news. So in recent news, we have a list which you saw before, and we don't have to really dwell on it because I'm going to show you them one by one. So first of all, we have the Leon Levy project. This is an amazing thing. The original scrolls photographs were done by a, a number of different people, but most of the stuff that had been in Jordan, which is the fragmentary difficult stuff, was photographed by a guy named Najib Albina, an Armenian photographer. And he was phenomenal, but he operated in ways that are not common. He created a whole set of photos that were available in positives and negatives. They were kept secret and they could not be seen by scholars except for those people who were the students of those people who were supposed to publish them and didn't publish them. And what happened is that eventually, when the entire thing was taken over by Israel, they came up with a project which is to provide all of the existing negatives plus brand new photographs done with exceptional new techniques. You see one in this picture here to uh, uh, make available the scrolls. And also they have provided information about the scrolls on their website. This has transformed the work of Dead Sea Scroll scholars because of the fact that we are able now to pull up on our own screens at any time, any of these pieces, see how they fit together, see how they don't fit together. And they have an ongoing uh, project there of recataloging the material, which is absolutely phenomenal, the way the work is being done and um, wonderful people working there and cooperating with all the scholars to make this material available. They're still making these new photographs because it's a very slow job, but I call them photographs. They really are not photographs at all. This has to do with uh, multispectral imaging, and they take some very large number of images that are then merged, and these merged images create the actual, what we call the photograph that we can pull up, and they're very high resolution and very helpful for our research. Now, actually, they're working now with a combination of uh, German uh, people, German uh, from the University of Göttingen, a German team, and some scholars in Israel from uh, Haifa, and they are putting together, it may take a while for this to happen, a kind of suite of software which will enable scholars to do additions on their program. I have no idea how well this will work. I've seen various demonstrations, but this promises to be very helpful for scrolls research. Now, a major new development, which is a negative development, is entry onto the scene of forged fragments. If someone offers you a fragment, they want to sell you one, don't buy it. These fragments come from 2002 on. They're forged. They were bought by various people. Here you see a, uh, a, a slide, courtesy of Colette Lal from Art Fraud Insights. This is showing you why the 16 scroll fragments that are held by the Museum of the Bible are all fraudulent. Among other things, you can see in these magnified examples that's going on here that the material was cracked before it was written on. And those cracks include the fragments on the side where the writing, the ink, is somehow the letters are shaped to fit on the broken little pieces. This isn't what happened in ancient scroll. If I take a scroll and you know break it into pieces, the writing shouldn't be in the cracks between what were the pieces. And anyhow, besides that stuff, it's been shown now that these things are written on leather and not what we call parchment. This has something to do with the way the fibers are arranged after the chemical processes 
that are used to create these writing materials. And the bottom line of it is that all of the fragments that came on the surface and on the market and were bought or published or anything else post 2002 are fake. And the funny thing is when I gave lectures like this, I used to say, by the way, there are some fragments out there. And if anybody wants to help the uh, scholarly field, if you have $1.6 million, we can buy a bunch of fragments and get them into the museum. Happily, no one took my advice because I see someone smiling here. I see happily no one took my advice because these things were all fakes. Okay, now, continuing along, we have the genetic research. This was just announced very recently. It's been going on for some time, but actually, believe it or not, about, oh, maybe 15, almost 20 years ago, a group uh, at Brigham Young University, this is a Mormon university, began a project to analyze DNA. And they found, as one would expect, that there were sheep, goats, and deer among the uh, scroll skins. But this recent uh, study has actually found that the things they study were all sheep. At any rate, it seems that uh, sheep skin was most common. Now, the problem here, the study was successful, but it proved nothing we didn't know. So let's take a look at this. First of all, density fragments made of animal skins are classified based on ancient DNA. Okay, that's good. The problem is, what do you do with it? And here's why. If I want to know if a piece belongs with another piece on the same sheet, it works. But they seem to have grossly oversimplified the market for skins in ancient times. Because no matter where I lived in the country, when I wanted to write a scroll, I would buy the writing material from a person who prepared leather for writing. That person who prepared leather for writing would have bought the skins from a tanner. And that tanner would have bought the skins from the guy who owned the animal and killed the animal. So I don't know if you can think the way they do that the skins of scrolls should be in related herds. I don't know really why that's true because your right shoe and your left shoe don't have to come from the same animal. Well, they seem to think you can, but and what they called here disambiguating the, de the debated relationship between fragments that it reveals new insights. This is partly true. If I want to know, does this fragment belong with this fragment on the same sheet? And eventually that will be a big advantage. Now, when they tell us that it proves that some scriptural scrolls were brought from outside Qumran, I have to tell you, I showed you the buildings that were occupied from about 100 BCE. Many, many Dead Sea Scrolls go way back before that. It's very obvious to all of the scholars, we've known this for years, that many of the scrolls were brought to Qumran from elsewhere. We're not copied there and not necessarily copied by the Qumran sectarians who live there, be they the Essenes or as most people think or somebody else. So this is a discovery of something we already knew. And the big example that we're supposed to prove this has to do with the book of Yirmiyahu. Now I have to tell you, according to the book of Yirmiyahu, there were two editions of the book. You may remember that the first edition of the book was sent to the, to, to, uh, around by Yirmiyahu. And then the book tells us that the scribe Baruch, this is the only book we have this information, was asked to make a second edition with additional prophecy. Well, we actually have in the Dead Sea Scrolls two editions of Yirmiyahu. And we know this. They seem to have come with the major discovery that the two editions of Yirmiyahu, that the skins of the two editions of Yirmiyahu come from two different places. Frankly, this is not surprising at all, because many of these biblical scrolls were brought by people who came to the sectarian center to study and to participate and came to Qumran where the sectarians were and brought their scrolls. So it seems we, that they've proven a bunch of things that we already knew. And this is the problem, whether they're gonna be capable of moving beyond that. Now the Manchester Fragments is a great story. And it's a great story because in the 50s, it actually links up, interestingly, with the business about the discovery of the uh, of fake scrolls proving that some of them are forged of these post-2002 fragments. Now, the reason that it links up is because the Manchester texts got there in the 50s, I mentioned this before, by because they wanted to be able to study the nature of the writing material of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jordanian authorities sent some stuff there. 
Now, what then happened was that these uh, materials lay there and became the possession of the University of Manchester, where they have some, they have distinguished uh, a history of the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And one of our colleagues there, Joan Taylor, noticed that she thought that these blank pieces actually had writing on them. And they were able to use various techniques of, uh, you know, electronic techniques to bring out the letters. And here you can see the word Shabbat right here on the fragment. And it turns out that these fragments have writing on them. So what will have to happen is they will have to now be analyzed from the point of view of what scrolls they may belong to. And sometimes we're able to restore a scroll by bringing one or two letters back. And once we know what the scroll really is and what it's talking about, this appears to be a scroll that's discussing Jewish law. And the broken second line on the bottom is probably the word, it's probably a broken ayin followed by a lamed, the word al, which is no thriller because it means on, so we don't know what it means. But at any rate, it seems that these fragments have writing and there's going to be a continued project to analyze them and see where they should be placed. Then there's another very interesting project going on now, which is a project which attempts to look at the specifics of who the writers are by tracing their handwritings. Now, there's been some previous research on this because we have an idea of the use of what we call paleography, which is the age of the writing. We date the scrolls that way over the period of time because of certain developments in the types of letters that are being written. And it turns out that uh, manuscripts can sometimes be identified, broken pieces identified with others, and they are working very carefully with a lot of computerized, very sophisticated computerized techniques. This is being done in Groningen, where Groningen in Holland, where there's an Institute for Dead Sea Scrolls Research, they got some computer type people together with some Dead Sea Scrolls people, and uh, they are working on this project and they're hoping eventually to be able to give us some very specific information about the scribes, the way they wrote the letters, a whole lot more information about how the scrolls were created. So that's another one of these projects. Now, what about good old fashioned scholarship? Good old fashioned scholarship has yielded a lot of new things in the period from basically 2002 when the scrolls were supposedly completely published. I say supposedly because some of them were in press, but they didn't come out all of them until 2009. And, uh, but at any rate, there's been tremendous work, new work on the archeology span of Qumran, the site, in fact, many of the old excavation reports have not been published, they're now being published. We have various new research methods. This is very important. Social science, religious study of women, and here's the, this whole question of context. Context is very important. They used to study the scrolls as if they were studying a bunch of weirdos in the desert. Now we understand that we're using it as a source that helps us to understand what's going on in general in the wider Jewish community, even though these people are dissidents who left that community physically because they didn't accept its religious ways. There's a very big uh, cemetery at Quran that has been mapped. I had the opportunity to be a very small part of that. And they used to say that all the sectarians were celibate. This was based that this was a celibate sect. I think this is now out of style. It's one of the things that was given to us by the group of Catholic priests that was involved initially in the publication of the scrolls in Jordan. And uh, they sort of identified it as a proto-Christian group. I think that point of view has, has left us. There's a whole big debate about how to see the collection of texts. Is it a canon of those texts that are declared authoritative? Is it a random collection or is it a library? I think we believe it's a library. I think that's what most scholars believe, but it's been a wonderful debate. Also, you know that's very popular now in scholarship to talk about orality, the phenomenon of what we do orally, but literacy and scribalism, what does it mean when you have a society in which writing is so important? Now, you know, the Talmudic system is based on oral tradition. We believe that there are two laws, a written law and an oral law. And the oral law is what explains to us how to put the written law into effect. Well, what we see in the scrolls is a different approach. That's also why it's a kind of sad you see like approach because it's mostly emphasizing the written text. 
and all of the non-biblical teachings are being written down, are being derived, and they are also being put into texts by scribal activity in which interpretation is being added to texts. Now we've also come to, I think, redefine in many ways the relationship of the scroll sect to Christianity and rabbinic Judaism. The big deal of Christianity is no one ever thinks anymore that there's some kind of direct link between the scrolls and Christianity. Rather, we understand that Christianity drew from Second Temple Judaism and some things that we wouldn't have known from the Mishnah and Talmud because they're part of these sectarian groups are observable, and now we understand where Christianity got them. Then, when it comes to rabbinic Judaism of the Mishnah and Talmud, we now see that the group that we have here is directly polemicizing against teachings of the Mishnah and Talmud. Some of these Mishnaic time teachings can now be proven to go back to a much earlier time because the Mishnah was edited in 200 CE by Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince. And we know that this, uh, these texts here are arguing, say in 125 or 150 BCE, they're arguing about some of these things that are so, we only see in the Mishnah. So it's clear that many of these Mishnahic traditions go way, way back in time, and we can see that and trace, in some cases, the continuity of these traditions over time, just as in the example of the tefillin and, and the, the mikvah that I wanted to show you at the beginning, and the shape of the overall scrolls to give you a sense of that continuity as well. But it's a continuity that we're learning about from people who disagreed with the rabbis. You understand what I'm saying? It's because they disagree so much that we can see aspects of continuity of rabbinic Judaism, either in things our friends here at Qumran disagree with, or in things that are common. And there are a whole bunch of shared motifs, teachings, and some exegetical, which means interpretive and fancy language, right? And we can see some of these traditions are also in common, even amidst groups that disagree about how to practice Judaism, because a key point here is that all these groups share what we call common Judaism. Everybody keeps Shabbat, everybody reads the Torah and learns to interpret the Torah to understand how they think one should live as a Jew. Everybody believes in God, etc., etc. right? As we see from our group here, not maybe everybody, but almost everybody hopes for the coming of a Messiah. There are a whole lot of things that we see more and more are part of this common Judaism. Now I just want to show you, this is the set, which was published, by the way, it's another British story, published by Oxford University Press, the official 42-volume publication, which when uh, I started out in the scrolls field, there were six. And uh, by the time uh, our group got into publishing the rest, we have 42, and all of the scrolls, every word virtually is actually published. And I just show you some sample of all the kind of research things that are being done now. It's only a small sample. You have no idea how many books there are about the Dead Sea Scrolls that we use in our research and that have been written by wonderful people, all kinds of scholars working on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And finally, simply to point out as we draw to a close and hopefully open for questions, that the scrolls have given us tremendous amount of new information about the Second Temple period. We now understand about the debates within Judaism, about what we could call the continuities that exist, the commonalities, the differences of opinion, the way in which eventually Judaism moves from this period of debate and disagreement into a period of consensus that comes after the destruction of the temple. And of course, as we know, there are many other transformations that happen with the destruction of the temple because the synagogue becomes the primary place of worship. Torah study takes on a much greater role. And of course, Judaism develops through the Mishnah and Talmud. That's another story we don't have time for, but I hope you have a sense here of some of these new developments and why you've been hearing things in the news about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Just bear in mind about one thing, the newspapers, especially Jerusalem Post and other Israeli papers, they love the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I think they love the Dead Sea Scrolls because actually what I find is there continues to be tremendous public interest in the scrolls. And I thank you for sharing in that interest and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you very, very much. Phew, what an amazing non-stop uh, uh, display of incredible information. The first question someone sent in, and anybody who'd like to send in questions can do so on the chat. Um, the first question is a more general one, is how widespread was literacy and how widespread were expensive writing materials, the quills and the ink, and how does that compare to perhaps non-Jewish people living in the same vicinity at the same time? This is a great question. The only problem is that there are a lot of different opinions. So let me shift gears from the Dead Sea Scrolls to another collection of manuscripts, which is absolutely fantastic, which is the manuscripts in the Bar Kokhba revolt period. From 132 to five, a lot of Jews went into hiding in caves along the shore of the Dead Sea. When they did that, they brought their personal papers with them. I, to truth, didn't understand this totally until I live in a community that uh, basically absorbed 25,000 or so Persian Jews after the revolution in Iran. There was a man started coming to Minyan in our shul. He could barely speak English, but he was coming every single day to Minchin Marev, and he had a briefcase in his hand. And one day I asked him, why do you come to shul with a briefcase in the hand? This was all of his legal papers. He never went anywhere without his legal papers. Then I understood what these people did. When they fled their homes during the revolt, around the southern shore of the sea, they brought all their papers. So this is really interesting, because we have letters of Bar Kokhba to his commanders. They apparently knew how to read and write. And we have legal documents in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and also another dialect of Aramaic that was used by a group of Arabs that we call the Nabataeans. So then you have to understand, it must have been the whole society was based on a kind of legal literacy. But there were also some people there who signed their names with an X. So it was obvious that not everybody there could read and write. Now, I actually heard a statistic recently, which I don't believe. I heard someone say that only 10 to 15% of the Jews could read and write. I don't believe it. I think that reading and writing was much more common, especially writing, a reading. Reading was much more common. But we don't really know. And there are opinions all over the place about it. I think it's pretty clear, though, that a lot more people could write than now when you say the general society, if you mean the Roman society, the most people could not write. You needed, everybody had to go to professional scribes and writing was not really possible for average people. So it seems that literacy was much more common in, uh, among Jews. But I have to say, you're gonna hear other views or see other views, and I can't really tell you that I'm sure about these views that I've given you myself. So that's, I think, uh, hopefully an answer. Thank you very much. The copper scroll, the question is, does that fact that it's on copper support the idea that the treasure is real? If it was imaginary treasure, why do we think they wrote it on copper, which must be hard to do? Yeah, I have to say the answer to that is yes, but no one's ever found a thing. Don't go looking because it's illegal to use a metal detector in Israel, right? And it's illegal to excavate anything archaeological without a license. But no one has ever found a thing. Now, there are two possibilities. They could have been hidden by the Jews who recovered them and used them for proper purposes, like the rebuilding of the nation after the war. We just don't know. So I have to say, this is the big mystery. So there was a conference, we're back to the UK again, in Manchester, England, I don't know, 15 years ago, on the Copper Scroll. And at, at that conference, they, uh, by the way, one of the things I remember is that those kosher dinners from that caterer, Hermolus, they were about 10 times as much food as each person could eat. So like they had enough food for 15 people for the six kosher people, it's crazy. But anyhow, right, uh, in Manchester, so we had uh, this conference, and as a joke, they took a vote. And the vast majority thought that the treasures were real. But the earlier scholars were convinced that they weren't. Very much. Someone wrote, did Roman law in any material extent influence, or was it incorporated into halacha? Roman law? Now, here's the thing. This is a very complicated question. This talks more about, not about the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you won't see any Roman or Hellenistic influence. When you go to the material from the Bar Kokhba period, again, the war was 132 to five, but the documents they bring are from earlier. Now we have to remember, the Jews who went into these caves were living in the Roman province of Judea, and after 106 CE, in the Provincia Arabia, the, Arab, the, the, the province of Arabia. So I don't know about you people, but I bought my house according to American law. 
I figure you bought it according to English law. You didn't use a halachic contract. So here you see all of these people using the regular legal system in various documents. Now, so there is a very big influence of Eastern Empire Roman law on these people because when I say influence, because it, 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 they bought houses, there are documents there for house purchase and sales and, and all kinds of business things that have to be done in a way that are gonna be legal. That doesn't mean that they're not in Aramaic, by the way, but they have, they're done according to the legal system there. And indeed we have some sufficient documents to know, I'll give you a small example. According to Roman law, a, ma a woman cannot be a guardian for a child. So this woman who left us an enormous number of, enormous, 20 something documents, Babata, she went to court because the uh, people who were managing her children's money after her husband died, the, the, uh, the uh, whatever you call the uh, agent who was managing, it's called a tutor in Latin. And of course the uh, apotropos is the Greek word for that, which is known from the Gomorrah. Anyhow, they were making 2%. And she went to the court and said, I can make 10%. This is terrible. My, my children are losing out. The court said, sorry, Roman law, you can't do it. Roman court. So the answer there is yes. Now, a more important question is, do the, in those places where the law of these documents and the law of the Mishnah is the same, are there Roman law influences? So the attempts to find real Roman law influences in Jewish law have been less than successful, even though a lot of scholars have written about it. And uh, a more interesting, positive, successful thing has been the attempt to find ancient Near Eastern precedents for the types of laws, which are not the ones, how do I do a mitzvah, but given the fact that there is an obligation of a certain kind, how, what are the mechanics? So what I mean by that is how do you write a contract? If there is an obligation, right, say, to, uh, to, to purchase, you know, and don't not steal, then the question is when I purchase, how do I write the contract? And some of those things are common between Jewish law and some of the ancient Near Eastern patterns, how witnesses work and that kind of stuff, right? So uh, there are parallels there, but Roman law is very, it, it's not been very successful. There's a big literature, but when you look at it, it's, it doesn't amount to much. Thank you. Um, if you're comfortable talking about it, how has your field of study influenced your own faith and development? Well, what I would say about is, is the following. First of all, it's a funny thing. We are trained as scholars not to allow our beliefs to influence the way we understand what's going on. Now, nobody is able to do that 100%. But the trick is that because we work with people who have different beliefs or non-beliefs or some beliefs, we're able somehow or another to be able to balance one another. So that's the opposite direction to the one you asked about. Because you asked how, okay. So what I find is, I find myself being strengthened in belief in the continuity of Judaism and the, the, the correctness of a lot of these traditions. Now, what you have to understand is that when you study these things, you're not going to get proofs of the things we'd love to prove. Can we prove there's a God? Can we prove that we, 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 you know, certain things, miracles happen? We'd love to have proofs for these things because everybody wants proofs for everything, even though, never mind that they're not supposed to be provable, but leave that aside. We'd love to find proofs. So on that level, you can't find proofs. But what you do find is confirmation of the historicity, the historical facticity of these traditions that we have. You're holding in your hand. You know what it's like to hold in your hand a piece of the Bible from 2,200 years old? Now, you can't hold it anymore, I got to tell you. Here's the thing. When in 19, whatever it was, 90, 95 or so, when the whole thing was open to the new group of scholars, when we first went to the Rockefeller Museum, they handed it to you and you could literally touch it. Now, now it's all in fancy containers and nobody can touch anything. These two women came from Russia to Israel who were conservators, expert conservators from papyri in Russia and they were appointed and then nobody's touching anything. But imagine holding in your hand a piece of a Tanakh of our Bible for 2,200 years. So there's a tremendous feeling of continuity. And I say that's, that's one of the biggest things. But now we have to be honest to say one thing, that continuity you learn from the scrolls and from other things that we study is not as simple as some people think it is. Where, you know, our, our forefathers, you know, had, uh, 
you know, uh, the exact same kind of talus bag that we had. Well, you think that your forefathers, you know, tw when Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Arsinai, he was carrying a Torah with silver crowns and two lions on the front of the cover. So, I mean, it, it, there are people for whom, if you're so simplistic, you'll, you, this is not going to work. But if you have a wider understanding of what we mean by continuity, that continuity also involves historical development, then it, for me, it, it confirms a lot of things. It's beautiful. Uh, someone wrote publicly, do you believe that there are more scrolls to be discovered or has everything either been found or destroyed? And then after this, if there's uh, one or two more questions, you can message me and I'll ask them and then we'll uh, end the evening. Okay, so let's start with the question of more scrolls. So there have been several searches by, conducted by the Israel Antiquities Authority and numerous illegal searches conducted by Bedouin and other treasure hunters that have not found anything except for a few finds during what's called Operation Scroll, which took place when uh, Jericho was about to be handed over to Yasser Arafat. And at that time, there was a very large team of 200, a combination of soldiers, Bedouin and archeologists, and uh, Hanan Eishel Zikronolov Racha, one of our colleagues, uh, he actually found a couple of items from the Bar Kokhba period. But it's, therefore, it's highly unlikely that anything will be, in fact, uh, will, will be found. But it's not impossible, because whoever would have believed in 1946 that in a year later they would find the Dead Sea Scrolls? Nobody would have believed it if you would have said it. So uh, you can't ever rule this out. And uh, the other thing that I would say about this is that many people used to think there were some scrolls out there that were in private hands. Now it's clear to us that that's fake stuff and not real. I want to point out one funny thing that I, I just wrote a uh, two or three page forward that's going to be printed in Russian with some volumes of, uh, that are sources for Russian history of the Jews in the Soviet Union. We have a big project at NYU, which I administrate. I don't do it, obviously, which, but it's under my administrative control of a, a large project to create a multi-volume history of the Jews in the, in the Soviet Union. It's almost finished. At any rate, I, in, in that introduction, I explained something that I've said many times. There are three great groups of texts that have come to the Jewish people from this, you could call them historical circumstances, discoveries in the recent times. First, there was the Cairo Geniza, which in the last latter part of the, uh, of the uh, 19th century and into the early 20th century, which gave us enormous numbers of manuscript fragments from medieval, medieval uh, Egypt, which gave us all kinds of rediscovery of the time of the Go'onim, the rabbis after the Talmud, tremendous material. Then there are the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran and the associated other Judean desert sites that we talked about here. And then there is the material that came to us as a result of the fall of the Soviet Union, both in terms of pre-Soviet history, Soviet history. This is also another example of the same phenomenon. So in our own time, we've inherited massive groups of texts. And so I would just say for those who want to find more Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe we need a little bit to remember what it says in Pirkei Avot, right? That Ezu uh, Ashira Sameach Lechako, who is rich, the one who is happy with his lot. And uh, we're still putting together the fragments of the jigsaw puzzle of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, some of us having a good time doing it also. And we have a lot of work to go. And uh, all of the material from the Cairo Geniza has not been analyzed. And just the beginning is happening now of the analysis of the enormous, enormous amount of archival material, let alone Hebrew manuscripts and other things that emerged from the fall of the Soviet Union. So uh, we, we have a lot of work to do, but you never know. They may discover something. And if they do, it'll be, you know, time to say Mazel Tov. And one final question. Someone mentions that the Kandu family still have scrolls, scrolls which remain unpublished. Uh, <laughs> this is the family. I hate to say this, but if you want to know where the fake stuff comes from, there's a lecture by me and a whole conference on the Museum of the Bible website. The final words in my lecture were, all roads lead to Bethlehem. So don't buy any scrolls. If they tell you they have scrolls, they don't, right? And they have old leather that they made it on somehow. Some people think it was made from shoes because there are some holes in these fake texts. They think that maybe it was made from, from some ancient sandals that were discovered. But uh, I don't think anybody has in their hands 
except a question that there are a few collectors who may have, in, among their purchases, may have purchased a couple of real things. There's a guy in uh, Norway, Skoyen, Martin Skoyen, much of his collection appears to be fake, but there are a few items he has that are the same as a manuscript that exists in the official collection. So it appears, and by the way, today and tomorrow, there's a conference going on in Norway. This morning I was listening to uh, Norway in the afternoon in Norway. I was listening to the conference in Norway in which people were discussing some of these very same issues. So at any rate, but I don't think that there's anything that's out there except the ones that we know about that are not known and the possibility of there being something in the cave, there is, but you know, not in the caves that, that have been searched and searched and searched. Asa, thank you so much for the most informative evening. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so, so much for engaging so beautifully. Um, incredibly fluent, very, very well presented. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, Koltov, we hope to see you in person when we're all able to travel. Yeah, okay, hopefully it'll God happen bless. soon. Thank Be you. Well. All the best, bye-bye.